I, I feel do feel very privileged to be here, and I really do applaud um, Nikki for actually doing something like this. I think we forget in our provincial areas that we have more power than we, we, we can see and that we have more opportunity. And as the world shifts and evolves, it, it, it is embracing more so um, food and, and fibres that come from regional areas and that have a beautiful story with them. And, it, and we don't have to have... Um, I think we forget in New Zealand that New Zealand isn't our story. New Zealand is a platform for multiple stories and every region will have its own story and every region will have its own feel from where that story has come from and its own history and uh, that's okay. We don't have to have one story coming out of New Zealand. And we also need to remember that every country has scenery. So our story isn't scenery. Our story is far deeper than that. And, and we, we tend to um, oversell what doesn't matter and undersell what is really important out on our global stage. So the more we can have sessions like this, the more we can work together um, is really important. And, and you don't have to have all the answers, and Nikki touched on this before, um, and, and I know Abby will talk more about this in, the, uh, in this afternoon, but don't feel that just because you have an idea, you have to have every single solution behind it. Work together, collaborate, that's how we get the best ideas, not by sitting in a silo and hoping that we come up with all the answers. Because your idea might be brilliant and it might be a seed for something wider, bigger or different. The whole, the whole point of my thing is making shit happen. Like, you know, we've actually got to be just, just make shit happen. I, I, I'm really worried at the moment. Um, I, I go to a lot of rural communities and all I hear is it's bad, it's terrible and then we say there's no confidence. There's no confidence because we keep telling people that it's bad and the more you tell people it's bad the more they start to believe it. And we're not coming out there and actually telling, and there is bad things right, I'm not trying to say oh the world's beautiful and we've got rainbows and unicorns, but shit will always happen. Bad things are always going to happen. The unknown is not new. The future has never been known, it's just moving at such a pace now that it just feels scarier and the navigation is more important. So I think, you know, if we can just try and make shit happen, that's really the key. Um, this is my, um, my sister and I on the school bus. So I grew up in Ross on the west coast of the South Island, uh, north of Haas, south of Hokitika. And, and, and literally, I still ride horses and look exactly, I'm the one at the front, look exactly like that on a horse. Um, I do dress, I don't necessarily wear dresses on horses anymore, but um, you know, it's really funny for me, like as kids we thought we were poor, because we lived off the land and we lived off, um, we, we had white bait, the lady next door used to put it on her garden, and now when I go to Auckland it's like $50 for a mane, and I just cry a little bit, I'm just like, <laughs> and I'm really snobby, I won't eat white bait from the North Island, I'm like, that's not white bait, only white bait comes from the west coast of the South Island. Um, you know, we used to, it's a shelf beach down there, so you could, you could surf cast and get snapper, and there were mussel beds that you could walk out to. And so we literally lived on mussel, snapper, white bait, fresh meat, um, possum. I mean, it wasn't one of our favourites, but some people did eat it. And um, I'm happy to wear it, not as happy to eat it. And, um, but, you know, we thought we were poor because we wanted fish fingers and sausages like the rich kids. And, and it's funny how you grow up and you forget the value and the beauty and the purity of being able to really eat from the land. And I recently went down to the coast to a similar event and um, it was really sad on the West, Co West Coast development signs, they don't have one picture of food there. And there were people in the room who have set up um, little tunnel houses and trying to grow food on the West Coast as well. And I think we just, you know, and they hadn't met. And I don't know if you've been to the West Coast, but it makes Gisborne look like a metropolitan city. It's, it's, it's tiny. The whole West Coast is really small. And they hadn't connected. And so I think the more we connect and the more we get those food provenance stories out there and actually have pride in them, then the more we can actually grow them. Um, I'm really proud of rural communities. I'm proud I grew up in one. Um, sadly, my parents lost every property they ever owned to mortgage sale. And I don't say this in, in like, woe is me, because it gave me a really good sense of humour and I learned how to meet people fast But when we moved. But um, I mean, we lived in some really interesting places, which actually developed us, right? So, we, so you know, serendipity. But um, ultimately, though, they did the same thing. And I love my parents and they gave us unconditional love, so this is not that they're bad people. But they kept doing the same thing and they got confused why they got the same result. And it just got kind of worse and worse. And, and so they would continue to do the same thing. They wouldn't adapt and they wouldn't evolve. And it's, again, not because they were bad people. It was just that generation and no one was coaching and guiding them. And so for me, I think it's really important that we lead our rural communities to understand that keeping things the same isn't actually helping them. Keeping things exactly as they are will never be an answer, no matter how much we want things to stay the same. Now that doesn't mean that we don't honour the past and that doesn't mean that we don't look after our history, but we need to adapt with respect. 
at the same time to make sure we've got economic relevance. Economics isn't dirty. You know, often people get quite funny about economics, but the reality of it is life costs money no matter what you do. No matter how beautiful your intention is with something, with a cause, someone's gonna cost, something's gonna cost money amongst that. So we need to make sure that our economics are right, but we must never ever compromise our environment and we must never ever compromise the community and the people within it to get that money. That's when it gets bad. But just because, if you can do all those things and keep your environment good, keep your economics good, then you're doing all the right things. And that will actually help grow the social strength of the communities as well. Um, this is my current herd though, because I live in the Waikato. Um, those two actually come from in the middle there, come from here. Um, the two coloured horses, they're awesome. They, um, everyone there is a little bit handicapped, so I kind of do a rescue thing. Everyone's got a little problem. Oh, except the only problem this little guy's got at the end there is that I cut his hair. That's the Mulfro I created the other day. Funnily enough, won't let me near him at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, so everyone's got a little bit of a handicap, oh, except for the cows. Oh, actually, the little white one's got a handicap. He licks everything. He licks the neighbour's goats. But um, I'm not sure where that came from. I think he may have got stuck in the, when he was born. But, uh, you know, for me, again, I live in a rural community now, and I'm really grateful of my neighbours. I travel a lot, so I travel multiple days in a week. And, you know, my neighbours are beautiful. They, they turn up, they fix my driveway, and they top my paddocks, and they, they message me and say, you know, one drove past the other day and was like, there's a dog in your paddock, is it meant to be there? And I, I don't, because I don't have a dog. And so, you know, things like that, that rural communities are really, really important and they keep you sane and they keep you real and they keep you grounded. And so protecting them is important to me, but again, as I said before, protection is about helping people understand how to adapt, not actually bringing people, um, or making them think that if we keep everything the same, it's going to be safe. Um, so we'll go through a little bit of a dem demographic of New Zealand, you all know what that is. But we don't underestimate how strong a food reputation we have. Um, I was in China in April doing some, some market research and you know when you talk to their, um, to their consumers or you talk to the supermarkets, what they actually say is, is people like to buy New Zealand's brand because it's pure. They sense it's pure and it's very highly respected. Um, they like to buy German dairy because um, they think it's like real safe, because you know, German, that sort of stuff. And so it's, it's, I think what's important to remember is we do have a strong reputation. It's important that we continue to grow and we never take that for granted. It's also important to remember that consumers are all different and there's billions of them and they'll like different things and they might not all love what we do. Um, that's at export earnings, not to be scoffed at. That's brilliant for a wee country like us. We, um, I think we, have the highest per capita production of food in the world. What we need to keep in perspective though is that that's 1% of the total food system of the world. So the total food system is about 8 trillion US dollars. And that's just under 1% of that, I think, although my math is bad and if it is over, apologies. Um, and so we've got to keep in mind that us producing, or how we produce and what we produce, is it's really important that we help or we understand our export consumer, what they're looking for, and that we meet that. So what we've got to look for is getting value for our values. Now that doesn't mean we breach our values and that doesn't mean we do bad things, it means that we understand what we have, what are the attributes that we create with our produce, and then when we go offshore we understand what what market is this important to and how do we connect those two. We kind of had this bit of a tradition in New Zealand is we produce as much shit as we can and we hope someone buys it. And then we get really excited and we stick it in a container and we go into market and then there's a boom because all these pigs start dying and everyone's like oh that's great let's just get more sheep and more, more cows and, and that's great and that might be an idea but it's not sustainable long term. And so how do we do things? And we're always going to have to evolve a little. And we might be changing and, and shifting into new markets. But it is important to remember that we're less than 1%, which makes us really agile, which is an advantage as well. But we always have to be thinking about our offshore consumer. Um, you know, this, we should never treat this though as, again, never take anything for granted, but we do have one of the highest levels of water per capita in the world as well. And, um, and, you, and you shouldn't take that for granted. I mean, I am on a bore at my property and when the pump breaks, you really understand the value of water. It's amazing when you go off town water, um, which to be fair, I've been off town water for years, but still, when something happens and you understand how important it is, like I'm really, really anal about how much water gets used on my property, like ridiculously. If I find a leak, I just about have a nervous breakdown and try and desperately fix it, which usually turns into breaking me breaking something else and then having to call someone to fix it. But 
I think it's important that we do have a lot of water, but we've got to keep it clean. And we can't, just because we have a lot of it, we can't actually just assume that that's good enough. But that, again, that is an advantage that means we can grow a lot of things. So, you know, there's all these great advantages that New Zealand has, but there's lots of different things happening offshore that we still need to be aware of. Now, I think the key is we've always got to focus on what we can control, but it's good to know what we can't and understand what we can as well. Um, one of them is they're making leather out of mushrooms. And the whole thing, of, you know, with synthetic clothing, it, it doesn't biodegrade. Um, well, it does, but I mean, like in 7,000 years or something. And so ultimately, the idea is if you're going to create a synthetic, let's create a synthetic that is able to biodegrade. Um, I mean, for me, I'm just like, I have the natural thing. But um, there's New Zealand king salmon, and one of the things that, you know, New Zealand can, will start to look at is open ocean fish, um, fish farms. Now, I'll be really honest, when I first heard of fish farming, I was like, oh, poo, smelly fish, yuck. Um, poor little fish trapped in a cage, it's really sad. And, um, and so I thought, oh, I need to learn about it because I'm being a dick, because I'm making judgments without information. And so basically, I'm being most of New Zealand. And, um, <laughs> and so I thought, right, okay, I'm gonna actually go and understand. And when you go to their farm, it's actually beautiful, like it's really well looked after. And, and what they're trying to do is innovate so they can go open ocean. So that they're able to, and it's done in the Netherlands, uh, not the Netherlands, Norway might be, um, where you're actually able to, so if there's a storm, they can drop the cages lower and they can sort of manage what's happening there. And also it means that they're able to, as far as the actual um, biodiversity goes, they're actually able to fellow the cages for longer and all those sorts of things. So there's lots of cool opportunities for New Zealand. And you know, when you look at a fish farm, it was crazy, like it's not a big surface area and the money that they pull off that. And again, I know it's not all about economics, but the ecology that happens underneath the nets was pretty cool. Um, and, and so there's all these things that we can do that we can actually have this really nice intersection of economics and environment. Um, and then the other one there is actually this really cool kitchen in, in the UK called Spice. And it's robotic kitchen. So look, you know, it's pretty basic. You, you can't, the menu's pretty much stir fried this or stir fry that. But what they, these young guys did who were computer programmers um, had an idea that how do you get affordable protein and affordable vegetables or nutrition into a restaurant. And so it's robotic, it's, I'm not a scientist, but it's kinetic something with the cooking. Um, they got a Michelin chef to actually create the menu and you order it and then people, there are people working in there, but it's not many people. And so it's a robotic thing and then it would just, but it measures and it puts it into the wok, it cooks it, and it's only like eight pounds, and you can get your protein and the vegetables that you wanted. So, I mean, things like that are starting to evolve. So it's not just what we eat's changing, but it's also how we eat. And then we've got alternative proteins. And, and I've, I've been talking about these for years, and I'm really sorry if this is gonna bore the shit out of everybody, because I think we just get beaten up with alternative protein talk all the time. But there's obviously the plant-based, and you'll be noticing if you're on social media, there's lots of banter around, we shouldn't call it milk, and we shouldn't call it milk, meat, and we shouldn't, and shouldn't, we shouldn't. And that's great, but in my experience, litigation is a really good waste of money, just over a name. Because I don't think consumers know everything about it, but at the same time, we can't expect the other side to play worse, so we win. So we can't expect that the alternative protein guys, um, um, they're doing really good marketing, they're getting out there and really talking about their product, we need to do the same. We need to make sure that people understand the nutrition of natural proteins, but there should be a place for both. It's absolutely, they'll live complementary together. We should never get upset and try and fight something. We shouldn't compete in the same space. We can position quite differently. But there's four sort of different kinds. This is a New Zealand company, Anteater. They're really cool. Go on their website. They're hilarious. They've got, um, they talk about their grass-fed locusts. And I'm not really a locust expert, but I suspect that they don't, I don't know what else they'd eat, really. Um, <laughs> they've got those little lemongrass ants that you put on meat. And, uh, you know, I kind of think that's quite cool, but who licked the first ant to work out that it tasted like? That's always my thing. I actually have to email them and ask. And, um, and, and you know, that's become massive. I mean, that's on some of the international MasterChef um, shows around the world um, and they've also got the hoo-hoo grub the little you know that's sold as tasting just like peanut butter I'll just eat peanut butter thanks and um, and then we've got alternative animals so you know we've got Pamu doing deer milk I don't know if anyone's ever tasted I mean I can't tell the difference but good on them you know um, just if you can milk it do it and um, and spring sheep are brilliant like for the great thing about spring sheep is I feel like that it's actually their values 
everything that they're doing is holistic. Um, they don't have bobby lambs, so everything gets reared. And it's really important that we don't have byproducts that kind of get wasted. Let's actually get a bit of a circular system going where everything has a value and everything means something and everything is important. And so, big, big lover of spring sheep and um, the whole camel milk's really popular, obviously not in New Zealand. And, um, but apparently it's really rich in vitamin C and like when you read about it, it's got like, apparently just, it's a super milk. And um, I don't know who wrote that and who did the research on it though. And, um, and that's really popular in France for chocolates. And, and when I worked at KPMG, our Doha office actually rang me once wanting to me to connect them with a um, camel farmer in New Zealand. I was like, you could have just probably Googled that. So I did actually Google it. Cause you've ever had one of those sick moments like, you're like, I don't know everything. And so I was like, Camel Farm in New Zealand while I was on the phone, I was like, oh, thank God, I haven't missed that one. Um, but you know, he actually had somebody that was setting up a whole, wanting to set up a whole supply chain for camel milk. So, you know, these things are evolving and, ch and changing. I mean, I think spring sheep's probably the most kind of commercial out of that. Um, and what you'll find with the likes of spring sheep too is, is um, lower footprint on the environment. As long as we don't do too much of it. There's always a, a low footprint until we do too much of it. Ugh. And then we've got cellular, and, and this is where people usually get a bit, um, I'll be honest, I would probably rather eat a pat, meat patty that was brewed in a, in a lab than one that was when someone turned a plant into a piece of meat. Has anyone had the Impossible Foods burger? Has anyone tried that? Yeah. It's like, it tastes like meat, right? You couldn't, I mean, I didn't like it, but it just, I mean, it wasn't awful. But I just, you know, you get, it was psychological. I was there, with, I was in Stanford with a whole lot of meat company people, and I think I was too scared to like it. I was like, I like this, they're gonna beat me up. But, um, <laughs> and you should have seen their faces, they were just like, I'm eating this under protest. Um, but then, you know, th what they're doing is incredible in the lab, but then there's also people taking stem cells and brewing them in vats. Now it looks quite gross, it actually looks white, and they put beetroot juice with it. But apparently they're working out how to grow fat, which oh, I feel like I could help them with. Um, and they're working out how to, how to grow muscle so you can actually get a well-rounded area of it. Um, I just did a dairy report and I actually interviewed the guys at Perfect Day Milk, um, a Perfect Day Food, sorry, and they do cellular milk, fermented milk. And I've got to be honest, they were just such cool guys. Kind of, I kind of felt like, oh, you're, you're our people. Because um, the Impossible Foods CEO, is, I just thought he was a dick. And, and I know, I mean, he's great, but he's just like, he's just so black and white, you know, there is no in between, there is, and I think there's space for all of us. It's great that we have these products because we need more food and people need to have choices. But I think sometimes when we get so black and white and so rigid with things, um, it just gets beyond what we want to have. But these guys at Perfect Day, I said, why? Why did you set this up? And it was such a cool reason. They wanted to be vegans and they didn't want to stop eating cheese. <laughs> and I thought, shit, that's good. You know, like, you think about it. These people just literally set up a product because they were scientists. So a couple of young guys at uni together. And the reason they wanted to be vegans was they were concerned about the factory farming in America and they were concerned about animal welfare and, um, and also environment and the impacts that were, ha that were coming through. So they created this science. And I really want to bring them out to New Zealand because it's, we're, quite, we're positioned in quite different areas and can work really collaboratively with such science and technology like this. It's not something I believe we need to fear. Um, there was a recent report out called Rethink Report and everyone got on that and they're all like so excited and apparently anyone who's farming animals is gonna be out of business in 10 years. And uh, you know, it's things like this we need to take a step back from. We need to take a step back when things seem so alarming and really look at the math behind them and really look at what they're about. And it will be our choice if we don't have a position in 10 years or not. Because if we choose to not change and we choose to not evolve, we won't. And, and Dean Foods in um, America just recently has gone into chapter 11, which is a nice way of saying they're pretty much going under. And um, it was really interesting that it came out and they blamed alternative proteins. Now, when you actually start to look through the history, their sales started to drop when bottled water came out because people stopped drinking milk and went to bottled water. So I think sometimes we tell ourselves a story that we want to believe. And what happened is there were signals that came out and the same happened in New Zealand with wool. There were signals saying that people's behaviours were changing and we chose not to change. We chose to believe it would go away and it doesn't just go away. We need to listen to signals. We don't necessarily need to knee-jerk react to them, but we need to listen. So look, I, I love alternative proteins. I, I actually do have um, cricket flour, by the way, in my house. Um, it grosses everyone out, but I use it, it makes me laugh. And um, 
But when you talk about the stuff, though, you've got to try it. You know, you can't be that person that doesn't actually give it a go. So I did just dry things, and then I'm like, oh, now I'm into that. Um, but I think, you know, the important message is, is that alternative proteins and, and natural, or whatever you want to call them, traditional animal proteins, can live in a really complementary fashion in the world. It doesn't need to be an, one or the other. It doesn't need to be if or that. It's pretty much together because we have lots of people coming onto the planet and we need to make sure we can feed everyone and people need to have choices. We just need to be careful that we don't compete with technology when we actually have beautiful natural resources that can be in quite a different space. And that's what we've got to work out though. You know, what do we actually want to be famous for? And we have this conversation, I'm part of the primary sector council and we're looking at a vision for New Zealand and, and you know, the real core of that is, is um, a tile principle and looking at you know, health of, of life force and that includes water and air and land and everything and, and making sure that that all comes together. So you know, what do we actually want to be famous for throughout New Zealand or your region or what you're trying to achieve with your business? When people think of you, what do you want to think of? And I think at New Zealand we panic because someone else does something so we give it a go. And that's what happened when we got into volume, right? Everyone was doing volume. We've got to do volume. We're freaking tiny. I went up to Russia. Um, I think KPMG were hoping I wouldn't make it back. But um, <laughs> so they sent me up there. And I visited a guy who had a farm that was 345,000 hectares. And, and he was buying the neighbour that was about the same. And it just blew my mind. I mean, to be fair, I've actually visited him in his bank in Moscow. I didn't actually get to the farm. But... Um, that's the crazy thing we've got to think about, is our, our scale was never going to be a volume game, it was never going to work. But that doesn't mean then we punish ourselves because we didn't have the right strategy at the time. Let's stop hindsight punishing, let's look forward and what do we achieve now? Um, and value is going to be most important, so we preserve our environment, we preserve our communities and, and that we're able to still get economics. But you know, we've got to think about it at an individual business level, community level and then a country level, what do we want to be famous for? And we've got to think about the consumer. And there's sort of four key areas with consumer that they're looking at. And under each one of these, there's about a thousand subheadings. So these are kind of collective things. But health and well-being around the world is becoming more important. And, and that's on many, many levels. So one thing is governments actually can't afford to keep curing people. So prevention is, is going to be far better than cure. And so there is now a drive to have people eat for well-being as opposed to um, just, you know, eating because we can. Um, but there is this health and wellness thing. And again, that's perceived differently for some. So some people eat plant-based meat products because they think it's best for health and well-being. And some people eat natural organic meats because they believe that come from animals because they believe that's best for well-being. So sometimes a lot of these things come into interpretation. But the key sort of heading here is that health and well-being. Um, the next one is experience. You know, restaurants are lighting tables now so when you take your Instagram shot I mean personally I no, no food stays in front of me long enough to actually be getting photos of it but it's um, like once I've ordered I'm mentally eating I'm like yeah I need it now um, so you know the experience side of it is really important too and for New Zealand and for communities how do we give people experience so for, it might be if your restaurants have, have local produce from Gisborne in it are they making sure that the story's there is there an experience around it is there something there that they can connect back to you know, people who are staying in cabins or whatever you might have set up here, making sure that the story of Gisborne is part of that, so it's a holistic experience. Um, the next one's impact on planet, which is self-explanatory. You know, we don't get another planet, and um, have debates with people all the time. I spoke in Nelson, and this woman said, put her hand up, said, what's the point? Mother Nature's just going to make us all extinct anyway. And um, <laughs> I know, I actually, I was a bit naughty, actually. I said, Jesus, you should go on a, a motivational speaking circuit with that kind of thinking. But um, which apparently you shouldn't say when you're at a, a woman's group and we're all meant to be supportive. Um, <laughs> women don't turn kindly to other women telling them things. And, um, and so, but you know, at the end of the day, let's not speed things up. If Mother Nature is going to knock us all off the planet, let's not give her, you know, let's not give her a reason to do it sooner than she should if we really believe in that. And I think it's important that we don't only preserve the planet, but we actually try and make it better than it was before. 
um, or not before humans, but but before whatever we've done recently. And then social impact, and that's really simple. Like, look after people who work for you. You look after people around you. You know, making sure that what we are doing is we are doing right, and and we are doing the right thing by others. And in the producer space in particular, I think we still have some work to do around how we look after our staff. Um, and and people don't want to work 100 hour weeks. And, and the reality of it is we're going to have to shift how we produce to, to fit in with, the, with people coming through that want a different and more, um, I guess, agile work system, even on our farming, in our farming space. But the funny thing with all this too is there's not one thing that people love or hate. There's a hierarchy. And within that hierarchy, there will be deal breakers and there'll be like nice to have. So it's, there's no one simple solution. There's always going to be multiple areas that you need to target and things that you need to look at. It's not just going to be one consumer. But always remember that first you've got to suss out that people like. And Abby will go into this way better than I can. People actually like what you're producing. Because I'll be honest, I have heaps of good ideas that nobody likes. And I'm like, oh, we should do this. It's great. I'm really a great idea. And it was because I had a great idea, but nobody else thought it was good. And no one's going to pay for it. So, you know, if you're going to produce something, make sure that it's not just something that you love and that you're not going to force people to buy it. So it's good to validate assumptions that you've made around what consumers think about your products, even early in, even in the early stages. And look, what does this all mean? You know, why can't New Zealand be a bit of a cuisine destination? And Eat New Zealand are doing a fantastic job at the moment of trying to grow this area and have people thinking more about New Zealand as a food destination. You know, when you walk through, um, you know, you get off the plane and you come through customs and all that, it's real cool, but there's not a lot of talk about food on there other than don't have it in your bag. And, um, and so it's like, oh, which you know they should have that God biosecurity is so important. But you know, at the end of the day, let's actually be promoting what we do and, and, and become a food destination. I think it's, um, we've got to have industry alignment too. And I think we tend to go sub-sector. So dairy, we're meat, we're fish, we're forestry, we're this. And then, and then I tell you what, and I mostly talk to um, red meat or dairy, to be honest. I go to an event, and if it's dairy, they're like, oh, those poor red meat people, they'll be out of work soon. It's all over for them. And then I go to the red meat sector, and they're like, oh, those poor dairy people. It's going to be really hard. They're going to be the hardest hit industry. I'm like, what? You're all going to be, you know, like, if one industry or one subsector succeeds, we've all failed. We have to actually succeed together and we have to succeed as catchments or as areas or as regions and we're going to have to have some compromise within subsectors so everyone can succeed. I think also as a country we want to own the whole supply chain and we can't own it all and, and all birds are a great example of they actually have gone out into market and, and they, they have partnered and they do things and there's other people doing that as well. Um, Meat Arca Milk partnered with um, others ice cream in, in Singapore and Udder's ice cream are really cool right they, they want to have natural milk, um, natural ice cream and what they did is they um, on every Singapore Airlines flight during the school holidays every kid got a little punnet of ice cream and, and the milk or the powder or whatever went into the ice cream came from Midaka. so there's these great collaborations and, and partnerships we can do we don't have to own it all we don't have to own everything to be a success. We can partner. What we've got to be really careful of is we just don't give our shit away for free. And we do, we do tend to come and become Santa Claus and go, oh, here you go, you're really nice. And then we always sell it. JV, make sure that we are keeping the value coming back to our country and coming back to our community, but allow us, it allows us to scale and grow. Um, look, I don't think anyone in here would ignore this, but I still get sometimes people like, oh, it's such a pain, and it's in particular in the farming community. And you know, I don't think that the government are going to win any. Um, they wouldn't win the communications election, um, communications Olympics around how the water and climate change stuff has been communicated. But consumers are demanding this, and they want it. Do you know Americans' crazy government doesn't even believe in climate change yet? They're their private businesses are pushing really hard to be climate neutral when they produce. So we need to just be a little bit careful that we take a bit of a step back from when these changes are coming in and we don't kind of over-personalise them and we actually think of New Zealand and our consumers and what we need to achieve. And by thinking of our consumers, that doesn't mean that we're not thinking about the people. Because the more we think about consumers and the best value we can get, the more we support our people back in New Zealand. And just... <sighs> 
we've got to be really good at what we do now. And that means we've got to be really good at business as well. And look, I'll be honest, I don't really enjoy numbers and, and ironically, given my history, I have always been in jobs that, are, that have them in them. <laughs> Fortunately, I've always been surrounded by teams that know what they're doing with them. But it's, it's, we do have to be really good at the business as well as good at the thing we're doing. So if we are growing a widget and we're selling that widget, we need to make sure that we are very, very good at actually doing that, but we've also got to be exceptional at the business. And always keep a one eye open on the future. That doesn't mean that we panic and we need you to create, but it does mean that we just need to work through and keep think about the future all the time, but be amazing at what we do now. And look, we need to have a startup mindset. It's, the whole thing with a startup mindset is you're not afraid to fail as you give stuff a go. And you know what upsets me about New Zealand is if you succeed, you're a dick. And if you fail, you're a dick. <laughs> so you know what that does? We just all run up the middle because nobody wants to be pointed out. And it's really sad because if you don't actually try stuff, now if you keep failing at doing the same thing, then you're failing, so stop. But um, <laughs> if, if, you're, if you fail and you try something and you go, okay, I learnt that it should have been a blue widget, not a green one, then make it blue. And then go back out and you're like, it should have been square, not round, and you go back out and you learn. And if you go and look at any of the tech companies or the tech, um, the guys who do venture capital in, in the States, they won't invest in a lot of the guys unless they've seen them fail a few times. And that's not because they're like psychos or anything, it's just purely that they, they will first want to really see them that they've tried and they've pushed themselves. So the startup mindset is about, and we've got to have it no matter how old our business is. If our business has been around 100 years, then we've got to make sure we still have a startup mindset. That doesn't mean we alter the business because it still could be popular and relevant, but the startup mindset says we continue to review our relevance and we continue to adapt where we need to. And make sure you've got people around you that can look into the future, and I don't mean that it can predict it, but I mean, because that'd be good, and if you do find that person, let me know who they are. Um, but, you know, let, make sure you have people around you that you support future thinking. Because when we have people that just tell us what we want to hear, or we have people that we have had in our world that work in the same industry, that don't actually talk to anyone else, that don't think differently, will actually shrink everyone's thinking. So we've got to be really careful that we're thinking into the future, we have people around us that can think differently and that are able to take us and support us in challenging our thinking. Now that doesn't mean we do exactly what they say and doesn't mean that we just change, but the more people challenge your thinking, the more you actually start to review. And look, I'll be honest, I don't really love it when people challenge my thinking, it actually gives me a headache and I get stressed and I like to be liked, so then I take it super personally, so on the outside I go, thank you for your feedback, and on the inside I'm like, they don't like me. But, you know, you get over yourself and you're like, shut up, who cares? You know, you're just being an egomaniac. Take it on board. What have you learnt from it? And what can you actually grow from that? And some of it you might park and go, meh, not relevant. And some of it you might go, actually, I can think a little bit differently now. But make sure your ecosystem's a little bit varied, a little bit different, and they're challenging. For the right reasons. Um, I think in our community... Or our processes need to get into attribute pricing. And, and I think, you know, and to be fair to them, they know and they're trying and blah, blah, blah. I don't know why they're not doing it, but they will. Um, Meat Ark and Milk are doing it. Sinlay do it really well. Um, not sure if any meat companies do it yet. And so um, I guess technically First Light actually do it. So First Light. But it's about making sure that we actually give people some indication and understanding of how we want them to, produce, them to produce and why we want them to produce. And it's not actually about the dollars. It's not necessarily about them getting a dollar extra for doing X. It's actually about the recognition for doing it. Because, you know, as much as our, our bottom 10% of producers at the moment might be a little bit upset about the world changing, our top 10%, our, our high performers are really upset because we're not recognising how good they are. And we're not recognising them that they ran ahead of the curve. And we're not recognising the investment that they have made and that they're not really getting the benefit from other than doing what is right, which is a huge benefit to the community. So we need to really be applauding and celebrating our higher performers more. Um, look, don't fear digital. And that doesn't mean that digital and data should never remove the human. And I, I, it, it's to enhance our um, intuition. It's not to t take it away. So it's not about Skynet, you know, let's not get the Terminator happening here just because we've got a drone running across something. It's about making sure that we actually utilise it the best that we can to help us make faster decisions. So you think of production now, we're going to have to have um, digital traceability and precision decisions. Because we have to do more or, or the same but better 
with the same amount of resources or potentially less. So that means our decisions are going to have to be incredibly precise. Um, and digital can support that. Now that doesn't mean that your intuition isn't amazing, but if your intuition can then be sped up a little so you can make quicker decisions, that's important. And we have to have digital traceability. Everyone around the world right now, nobody trusts anyone and nobody trusts things in the food system. And I know that's really sad, but what we have to do is make sure that we actually have some way of tracing how we produce, what we're doing. Being good bastards is not actually enough. We are trusted, and yep, as the first slide said, you know, we are considered very trustworthy, but we do have to, if we make claims, we need, need to be able to back them up with evidence. And then I think we just need to think about, again, and this is getting our heads out of um, being subsectors, is are there some parts of land that could be better used for something else? And maybe they can't. I don't have an answer for this. And, and when, usually when I say it, people get a bit upset. I had people shout, old people shouting at me in Taranaki on Friday night. Um, I was just like, oh. Um, but you know, it doesn't mean that we stop doing what we're doing necessarily. We might just evolve it slightly. And it might mean that we have some sort of biodiversity on our farms. We might have, I think the future farm is going to look a lot like a country calendar episode. And, um, and, and you know, and that's good. I mean that nicely. Um, but when I was banking, I used to think, oh, I want to see the books on that before I uh, think it's great. But, um, you know, I, I think biodiversity and doing it well so it can be economic as well and, and being able to support, support multiple different types of production on one area. And I promise this ends soon. But I mean, I think, look, oh, some little key points, and I usually hate word, having words on slides, but um, it's embrace your failure because it really is the gateway to success. So give things a go. Now, don't put it all on black so you don't bet the house on it. But do things, you know, that's the key is sometimes I think we go, yeah, let's get in. And then they're like, we failed. It's crap and now I've lost my house. So you kind of do it in a way. So in farming context, um, regenerative at the moment. And I love, I love regenerative. I love the concept of it. I love the th thinking around it. But when people don't like it, they get a bit sassy about it. And I'm like, well, if you don't like it, don't do it. You're right. Don't get upset because your neighbour did it. and didn't impact you. Um, but, you know, maybe just try a couple of hectares of things if you're a farmer or if you're a business Try a product and just say, look, I'm happy to lose 20 grand, 10 grand, 5 grand, whatever you can, but just do it in a way that's kind of quite balanced so that you don't lose the business, but you are actually evolving and changing. And be flexible and open. You know, you, you might come up with a blue widget idea that evolves into a yellow circle idea. I don't know, but just be open to things of changing things and keep validating your market and going back out, but just be really open. And bounce well, shit hurts, you're gonna fall. I tell you what, change and resilience is like a muscle. It's, um, I got asked the other day, you know, I obviously like change, I'll be really straight with you. I, I don't necessarily know if I like change, I just know that's how I'm gonna survive. I am one income, one person, I financially support my parents, I have invalid horses that have expensive vet bills and they're really important to me and I love them and they are my, my everything and so, I continue to evolve to make sure that I have relevance so that I can survive. That's my change drive. And I think we're all different in that space, but just try and bounce well. You will get knockbacks, things will hurt, you will feel bad, you're entitled to feel bad. It's not that you gotta just enjoy all the bad shit. You're allowed to have those down days, just don't let them go forever. And opportunity actually doesn't come to you. Necessarily, it might do. I mean, I've got a friend who basically has never had to interview for a job. She just keeps getting offered them. I said, Jesus, I usually have seven interviews and then they want to put me through a psychologist. And it's always down to once that happens because you're like, Jesus, psychologist is going to be like, she's nuts, get away from her. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's those sorts of things. So, But, you know, just keep looking and pushing for opportunity because things aren't just going to magically change themselves. But if you change your business or look for different opportunities and be open and talk to different people, you'll find it. And sometimes that opportunity won't be obvious, and it might not necessarily be the perfect opportunity you wanted, but if it's a difference between survival or not, that's really important to think about. And no matter how bad shit gets, or feels like it's getting, everything actually will be okay. Um, I think we are survivors, this, well, I know we're survivors. This country has been innovators forever, since the beginning of time. Um, and we forget that we um, are able to innovate and change and evolve and it's not going to stop. So I can't tell you that one day we're going to be sitting here going, oh, I wish there was some change happening or a bit bored. Um, we're not, and it's probably not in our lifetime anyway, but everything will be okay. We just have to stop, breathe, and think about what we need to do and continue to focus on solutions and stop telling ourselves that it's the end of the world. 
And look, and I'd, I'd just be the very most important thing that every region and every part of our country needs to do. Um, and, and I say this probably from a very personal level. So um, I grew up in Westland and, you know, I was actually really upset when the Westland factory was sold. And, and I know that it's probably really good for the community in the immediate time. Um, my, the first thing I thought of, though, was that people aren't born yet, that decisions have been made for them that will impact them. And if those farms are sold, and they potentially will be at some point, then that's potentially a whole province that we've, we've sold um, that, and, and made decisions for our future generations. And I think we've just got to be able to go beyond, you know, we, we've kind of got this new word in New Zealand now, and I know, um, you know, in Māori communities it's certainly not new, intergenerational. Um, but then even then we're putting a cap on it, and it's about 25 years. What the, like, why don't we think like what, 10 generations forward? Don't just go intergenerational as it's like 25 years. It's actually got to be further than that. We've got to be wider. It's got to be stronger because each time we do something in each generation, they have a right to enjoy what we have and we don't have the right to take that away from them. So um, that's pretty much it from me. Look, there's my contact details. I am very happy to talk to anyone anytime. Yeah, so I think if you look back at most of New Zealand's marketing, we've got scenery. Um, and we forget to talk about the rich nutrition and deep nutrition that we have within our products and, and we've often missed that. We don't necessarily hero our production method and we just talk about the product. So often going into market you'll find that people, and, and I've been looking at environment social governance reporting too and we do the same there with our reporting. So it's, it must be a mindset thing that we have. What that means is our distance means that we are assuming what consumers are interested in and we're marketing in a way that means something to us. And so it means something to us to see scenery and it means something to us to see the mountains, but often it looks just like Canada or Switzerland or whatever. So we need to actually be quite specific around what we're doing and be selling those key points. And one thing that we had missed is nutrition. And it's great to see, I think, um, First Light have done some really cool research with Auckland University. Um, you see Fonterra getting more into talking about nutrition and, and that's the thing. Because health, right? This is health. This is heart. This is um, how we produce and, and, and that's why you've got to make sure you produce in a healthy way because that will create healthy food. But we've just got to be really careful that we don't get hung up on our little, and what we did, did tend to do was this purity, clean green, worst bloody words we could have ever muttered because it's not real, you know, like it's what does that mean? So th those are the things. Sorry, that probably was a really long-winded answer to a simple question. Yeah, it's such a good point. I, um, my neighbour is Welsh and he went over to Wales, as you would because you, when you wash and um and he sent me a photo from a supermarket in Wales and it was it was budget milk and it had this beautiful story about the Welsh farmers on the back and um you'd kind of be hard pressed to find adverts in New Zealand that actually identify the farm it starts with the farmer silver fern farms big ups to them have you seen the new ads awesome it talks about when you prepare your meal it starts with the farmer preparing their food. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Praise the Lord, somebody got it. And so it's just, a, you know, that's what we've got to remember is, is the people behind it and actually heroing how it starts. Yeah, so when I talked to the Perfect Day guys, um, I said, I actually asked them about the future. What does it look like? And they want to be 80% of the commodity market in America. So that's their goal. So they don't want, like, the per if you talk to the Impossible Foods guy, he just wants all pro animal production gone off the planet. Um, he's real like hardcore. He, at first he actually had, um, he wanted to, it only be 2% and I thought, oh that's cool, that could be New Zealand. That works well for us. Because um, you know, Monopoly's always quite good. And um, they work well. And, um, but, but you know, he then went to now none. But the perfect day guys, it was reducing it down to 80% and, and actually supporting the family farm. So we just, we shouldn't compete against those technologies and we shouldn't get all upset because they are brown paper bag full of stuff or things cut in quarters in, a, in a, basically a giant container aren't necessarily going to see us into the future. And I know what you guys are trying to do is amazing and the technologies that are coming through. I guess my only question would be let's not frighten the people that naturally produce because what they hear is I'm no longer relevant. We just need to show them where that position is that they are relevant. So there's definitely, if we could, if we could have a perfect day vat in every milk company around New Zealand or whatever the technology is, um, and that when we didn't need to necessarily winter milk and we could fill those gaps and we could actually really do a pure production curve, then those, I think those sorts of things would be a success and that takes care of that commodity space and we go into value.